Hello friends and family, and welcome to our boring meditation stuff. I decided that I'm just going to keep putting up the, the instructions for installing the Anapana instructions on your phone at the end of every video. Um, partly because I don't really know who's watching these. I think it's mostly my mom. <laughs> and um, there have been a few random people who have watched them or watched one video, and I think it would be helpful um, given them or not. I'm not repeatedly explaining what these videos are about um, or the idea of Anapana meditation or any of those things. Um, because that would be boring for my mom to listen to every day. So for those folks, those, those videos will just be linked at the end when I say goodbye. Um, we spoke about sleep uh, and this idea of autopilot, actually. Um, and I wanted to talk about sleep again partly in terms of autopilot, but um, not sleep as a kind of thought exercise, but sleep itself as a form of autopilot. And I think that it's possible that um, it's not entirely clear what I mean when I say autopilot. And uh, I thought of a really clear example today as I was going downstairs for my run. Um, the staircase in this building winds its way around the elevator, the lift. Um, and on three sides, there are stairs. And on one side, it's the kind of the apartment entryway area. And um, I was, I actually forgot um, something at home. And so I ran up the stairs and then I was kind of half jogging down the stairs. And I noticed at one of these landing areas that I actually, I closed my eyes for a few steps. And when I opened my eyes and found, oh good, I opened my eyes just in time for me to take the stairs. I think normally we wouldn't worry about that too much, but I was thinking about this whole idea of autopilot. And I realized that this is, this is entirely a form of autopilot, right? This isn't conscious. I didn't consciously say, okay, I'm going to close my eyes now. One, two, three steps, I can open my eyes. Now there's stairs. Um, I closed my eyes to like wipe away some sweat or something. I don't even remember why I closed my eyes, but it was very natural and also very dangerous. <laughs> like you could imagine um, if your mind wanders for a split second and you take an extra step and you go tumbling down the stairs, um, but we tend not to do that. Um, and all of these activities that we've ingrained in ourselves, walking, running, taking the stairs, um, even some more peculiar ones where we're holding a bunch of like grocery bags and managing a phone for some reason. Like we can do those things and we're not thinking about what we're doing. Um, proprioception gives us a lot of leeway in terms of like, oh, okay, I know where my body is intuitively. Um, and this sort of intuition is really helpful in everyday life. We don't need to constantly be obsessing about the details of where our body is or what we're doing. Um, but all of that is sort of autopilot. Um, walking in particular, like the, the total lack of awareness we have about walking um, is autopilot. And this isn't about walking meditation or anything like that. I'm just talking about normal walking. Like most of the time, we're not thinking about walking as we're walking. Um, and that's fine. <laughs> Our body still works and we don't fall down. Um, the controlled fall of walking that it is, uh, our body manages it for us or some background process of the mind manages that for us. Um, and in this same way, all other habit patterns we have are autopilot. 
Um, I apologize. That's an alarm. <laughs> um, and one example of this is actually sleep itself. So sleep, the way that we sleep, the way that we dream, um, is autopilot. Uh, it's very natural. I mean, a newborn baby sleeps. So it's not an autopilot that we've developed. It's not an autopilot that we've taught ourselves or grown for ourselves or had taught to us. Um, this is a completely natural thing. And there is a reason that the phrase is sleeps like a baby. <laughs> um, because a baby is really good at sleeping. And um, I've, I've been watching videos of my new niece on the other side of the earth. Um, and she's still young enough to qualify as a baby. And um, she seems very like peaceful. And when she sleeps, um, I think that she gets very restful sleep. And I think that we adults have actually, if we've learned anything, we've learned how to walk, um, which she's currently in the process of doing, and we've learned how to break our sleep. Um, we've all had the experience of staying up anxious, um, even panicky sometimes, because we can't get uh, something off of our mind. and. Um, this is a, a broken habit pattern. This is an unhealthy habit pattern to have broken the sleep that used to be so natural and so healthy for us as children. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I've heard this argument um, both from philosophers but also from monastics and also from meditators um, that sleep and meditation can be compared. Um, that you could say, oh, like in terms of uh, like letting go and trusting the process and things like that, the meditation side of the equation will often say, well, you do this every night, like you where do you go when you sleep? You, you just trust that it's going to be okay. And when you wake up, you are healthier. Um, it is a refreshing process and meditation can be like that. Um, and meditation can be like that, but I don't necessarily know that that is um, a very helpful description of meditation to those of us who are in the beginning stages of meditation. Um, because it tends to be a fairly narrow kind of meditation which works this way, you know, this kind of um, restful, uh, flowing kind of um, process. On the other side, the philosophers will give you, and some of my favorite philosophers, um, Cheng Tzu and uh, those folk will they'll give you this description and it makes a lot of sense from the point of view of philosophy that oh you go to sleep at night and your certainty regarding who you are what you are what your consciousness is is lifted uh, and so the the story about Cheng Tzu is a very short story he supposedly goes to a friend and says to his friend, um, I was sleeping last night and I dreamt I was a fish, or am I dreaming now and really I'm the fish asleep? Um, and Cheng Tzu's little short story is as far as you can take this um, kind of intellectual exploration of the topic of consciousness in sleep. Um, there are significant differences that we are familiar with 
both in psychology and neuroscience with respect to the difference between dreaming sleep and deep sleep. Um, and those differences do actually pertain to meditation. So there is a point at which um, you will find that you are able to meditate while you sleep um, to some extent. It's difficult and it's not very satisfying um, in my experience, but it is possible. And in particular in dreaming sleep. So the way that that tends to work is that you sort of awaken to the dream, right? You realize, oh, I'm dreaming. Oh, okay, keep meditating. And you meditate, meditate, meditate in the dream. Um, and maybe that wakes you up, maybe it doesn't. Uh, lucid dreaming tends to have that effect, especially on um, people who are new to lucid dreaming. Um, and for this reason, the fact that these things can be overlaid, you can meditate while sleeping. The comparison of sleep to meditation is kind of a broken one. You can't say, oh, over here is sleep and over here is meditation. And sleep is this sort of like meditation, like, you know, sleep, right? You do that every night. So meditation is not so different. It's like, well, meditation is quite different, actually, because you can actually erase sleep um, at higher stages. I mean, this isn't a thing that you and I will probably ever do, but monastics tend to sleep very, very little, I mean, two, three hours a night of actual honest to goodness sleep. And a lot of the rest of the time that they spend lying in bed is meditating and they get a lot of rest from that meditation, but it is not sleep and it is not comparable to sleep. Um, they are very alert, very awake, very cognizant of what they're doing. Um, and all of this uh, is an answer to a question <laughs> a friend asked me once. Um, I was staying in his house and I was going to go downstairs uh, to meditate in the evening. I was like, oh, okay, good night. Like, I'm going to go meditate for an hour. And he asked me a sincere question, which was, is the, is the one hour of meditation really any more valuable than the one hour of sleep that you would get in that same time span if you are able to go to sleep? Um, and at the time I sort of laughed it off because it's a difficult topic to approach because um, the answer is it depends but it depends on uh, your circumstances as a meditator and as a sleeper. So it is not always the case that one hour of meditation is going to be more beneficial than one hour of sleep. Um, and you won't know in advance, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so you can't pick and choose based on that. But it is possible to meditate poorly. There are many different techniques of meditation. If you choose to meditate with a technique which is not effective for you, um, or even just not effective for you at that time, then obviously that's, that's not uh, very useful. Um, it may be useful in the long run, that one hour, but in the immediate, maybe not. Similarly with sleep. So for someone who has learned to break their sleep, as I was describing, this idea that you can, you can upset this mind-body complex enough, and we all have, right, that it's difficult to sleep at night. Um, again, right, <laughs> how do you sleep at night? Like, you should be so anxious that you can't sleep. Um, it's that common that everyone has experienced this. So if we've all experienced this, then we can f certainly extrapolate, 
right? We can say if on one end there are babies who sleep like babies, um, assuming they're a good sleeper, right? <laughs> like there are babies who have trouble sleeping. Um, but like the natural, normal, like long periods of sleep that many babies get um, and are caused for the phrase. And then somewhere along the line is like, you're unable to fall asleep, so anxious, so uptight, so bothered by something in your mind that you cannot sleep. And then eventually in your body because your mind affects your body that we can extrapolate this out. Of course, there is someone for whom sleep itself is not even really restful. And I've had nights of sleep like this. I lie down and I'll sleep for eight, nine, 10, 11 hours. And I get up and I'm exhausted because I've been dreaming about my problems. I've been obsessing during my sleep. And the sleep itself is not really the restful sleep that a healthy baby gets or that a healthy, healthy adult gets. Um, and in that case, we extract the one hour and we say, oh, okay, one hour of that sleep, the worst one hour, is that better or worse than one hour of meditation? Well, obviously worse. Um, you were probably better off to stay awake, right? And do something moderately restful. Listen to some music, read a book, anything. Distract yourself is probably better than obsessing while you are asleep, if your sleep is that bad. And I think that those of us who have trouble falling asleep probably don't have that kind of really upset, um, disrupted and disrupting sleep very often, or at least I hope we don't, um, because that's a very unhealthy state to be in where you fall asleep and you wake up often more tired after uh, a night of sleep like that. Um, and th this is where these two ideas kind of come in contact again. So the idea that you can meditate while you sleep at a high stage, right? If monks and nuns and so on, these people can meditate while they're sleeping. Oh, okay, neat. But what about us? What about the, the regular people, the average people? Um, what is the relationship between meditation and sleep? And this is actually one of the marketing techniques of contemporary meditation approaches, mindfulness, etc. cetera, um, is that, oh, you'll get such a good sleep. Um, and I don't think anyone can make that promise. You will not necessarily start sleeping better just because you've started meditating. But the entire activity of meditating is about breaking habit patterns. So ha habit patterns where habit patterns are essentially um, this autopilot of consciousness. My consciousness wants to do this, and then it wants to do this, and then it wants to do this, and then this leads back to this. And I just keep doing the same right, over and over again, right? This, this pattern. Um, and that could be anxiety, that can be fear, that can be all sorts of craving um, for the things we don't have, right? Um, and meditation, stops that process. It may not stop it immediately, um, and it won't stop it permanently, at least not to start with, um, but it stops that process. It says, okay, look, the reason this process exists at all is because your mind and your body are caught in a sort of loop, and you can stop that loop. You can turn it off. Um, the way that loop works is by the object of your attention. So if you're anxious about a thing, keeping it in your mind intentionally or unintentionally is what makes you anxious about that thing. 
If you are anxious about abstract anxiety, that becomes an object, right? It's, that's not against the rules to have a very complicated, high-level kind of anxiety going on, but there's still an object of your attention, an object of your awareness. Any of us who've ever been extremely anxious, even momentarily, realize that that sort of anxiety is not a fixed object. I mean, most of our thought processes, our default thought processes are not a fixed object. We tend to be jumping around a lot. But that kind of anxiety tends to leave us fried, um, where we're just jumping around like crazy, right? I was like, oh, what about my taxes? What about my mom? What about this? What about that? Um, that's a very high level anxi of anxiety where the object isn't even necessarily bothering us so much. Um, it's actually the movement between the objects. <laughs> Uh, and that, the movement, um, can itself feel like abstract anxiety and then the abstract anxiety becomes another object. But it just gets added to the thousands and thousands of objects that were already in the, the set, right, of things that we're paying attention to. Meditation says there's one object. Right. Okay, take this object, here you go. There's one object. <laughs> and every time you get stuck over here in the collection of other things, you just keep pulling yourself back to the one object. And this one object has no anxiety attached to it. It has no real anything attached to it except for inherent truth. And that is really all that uh, meditation, anapana, or vipassana is. Um, and to round out this explanation, the reason that that is valuable is because anxiety, sadness, depression, fear, craving, anger, hatred, whatever is going on over here, right? It doesn't just have to be anxiety. Um, this space, is what gives you a bad sleep, <laughs> one way or the other, right? Bad sleep tends to be derivative of anxiety, but I mean, all sorts of other things. I mean, I've certainly laid awake, angry with someone, unable to sleep. Oh, grr, grr, I'm so angry, right? <laughs> Everyone knows these feelings. Um, and the exercise of taking the single object and saying, oh, okay, this is the object taking it and I'm bringing my attention back and I'm bringing my attention back is to train the default pattern of the mind to do what you say. Listen to me. <laughs> I know what I want. I don't want to obsess angrily for two hours and get two hours less sleep. I would rather go to sleep. If I'm still angry tomorrow, I'm still angry tomorrow. Okay, fine, I'll deal with that. But I don't need to lose sleep over anger. I don't need to lose sleep over things I cannot affect while I'm lying here in bed, wishing I was going to sleep. And the consequences of this should be understood to be not permanent. Um, and I'll, I'll go into this in another talk because this has been going on for a long time. But it should be understood that, oh, okay, I meditated for a week or I meditated for three weeks, uh, Anubana, and now my sleep is better. Um, that won't always be the case. You will still have nights where you can't go to sleep. You will still have mornings where you wake up feeling terrible because the sleep that you got was not high quality sleep. And you'll need to be okay with that. <laughs> the, this idea that, um, that meditation is a sort of cure-all, it's obviously incorrect. Um, but we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, maybe in the next video. Um, I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves. I do hope that despite all this talk uh, that you're 
already getting a very good sleep, um, like a baby. <laughs> and I hope that you're taking care of everyone around you so that they can also get a nice, relaxing sleep. Okay, I will talk to you all tomorrow. Goodbye.